So um, this ad is sponsored by Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Hello, this is Robin Norgren, and I'm your host for Montessori Creativity and the Meaning of Life. I'd like to begin by reading the words from Psalm 33, 4 through 7 in the New Living Translation with some thoughts by Eugene Peterson. For God's word is solid to the core. Everything he makes is sound, inside and out. He loves it when everything fits. When his world is in plumb line true, earth is drenched in God's affectionate satisfaction. The skies were made by God's command. He breathed the words and the stars popped out. He scooped sea into his jug, put ocean in his keg. It is so easy to focus on the brokenness of our world and our lives. We are bombarded by stories and circumstances that demonstrate the need for a savior and for hope beyond this life. In the midst of that, however, we must forget that God created the world and he called it good. Let's not forget that. And beneath all of the brokenness is still a creation meant to glorify him. What a person produces and how they work can often tell us much of who they are. What do these descriptions of God's creations, whether the world or his word, tell us about the character of God? What is the scope of God's power? What brings God joy? What do you think it means that God loves when everything fits? Does it mean he has a bent for tidiness or something much more profound and beautiful? Praise God for his good creation, whether it's the plants outside your window, the peace of your home, the security of your job. He has designed all things in this wide world with tender affection and ultimate power. Thank God for his workmanship. God delights when things are balanced and true, but the world is still fallen and weary. Cling to the thought that God's ultimate creation plan is good, ordered, and pointing to glory. No matter how busy your day, today, or tomorrow is. For my book, Your Creative Peace, Find and Deepen Your Creative Voice While Communing with God, can you make peace with your imperfection? I decided to take baby steps with the collaboration process I was a part of. I knew the task would be too overwhelming unless I put together an action plan. I made a deal with myself that at each sitting I would work on two sketches at a time, no more, no less. That way, if I had a, quote, good session, unquote, meaning the thoughts and designs came together with ease, I would end on a good note. And in the event I was just pushing rocks up a very steep hill, I could see the end in sight and not throw in the towel on the whole excursion. But first, I had to come up with 14 sketches. 14 sketches. I took a deep breath. Okay, maybe many deep breaths. I got a sitter for my little one. I made a space in my apartment dedicated to this project. I set up my table. I laid out my paper and my acrylic paint. I placed all around me various types of scrapbook paper, which really inspires me color-wise. In an earlier session, I was looking at the beginnings of 
some different uh, ideas from other artists. And I also had found some children's books at the library where I could look at the structure of um, boys' silhouettes, boy and girl silhouettes for the yoga sketches I was doing. And this inspired me to really get a sense of play around the illustrations. But I really needed to get it down on paper and not just think about it. I had some paper that I got on a trip last year from a little shop just south of France filled with creative loveliness. It felt like a treat to use the paper and that helped me move it along. The feelings for the paper fueled even more excitement in me. This indeed was a special occasion. Now that I think about it, I guess I could have had the opposite effect on me, where I could have been afraid to touch the precious paper, but luckily I chose to look at it as this is my first ever set of illustrations and I wanted to document it by using something special. I got to work and I allowed the time and the agenda to take me to places I would have felt scared to go on my own. I wanted it to be good but I also wanted to see what I could do. Do you know that point in time that an exciting idea becomes work? I have known that at some point the transition would occur, but I chose to kind of avoid thinking about it until I couldn't avoid it any longer. I had some really successful first sessions. Sessions one and two were fantastic. The feelings were so euphoric I thought to myself, why in the world had I not considered doing illustration before? I had three of the 14 completed and approved by my partner in the collaboration. Now I just had to finish 11 more pieces. And I'll look at it like playtime. Okay, not really, but you know, not as hard as I first anticipated it to be. I'm used to working in fits and starts, working around my haphazard time constraints as a mother with a little one not yet in school, and as a deployed military spouse. Now I was learning to work with the pressures of expectations of a project from someone else. Oh, and did I mention that my partner also is the sole investor in the project? She wanted to fully fund the project. It was a bit of friend, uh, pressure on our friendship for sure. As I went into the next sessions, I prepped my iPod for making a substantial go at the thing. I happened to come across an interview from Rob Bell on his book, Drop Light Stars. He shared his struggles of being a full-time pastor, but sensing God's call to the arts through writing and DVD production. It was the right interview at the right time for my heart and journey. What I've learned is you have to get comfortable with imperfection. You have to get comfortable with what you don't know. You have to get comfortable with that nagging thought in your head as to whether or not you know enough to do something. You have to get comfortable that others might do things differently than you. And you have to get comfortable in your identity as an artist. T.D. Jakes writes in his book, Crushing, you must make time for rest. More than make time, you must make rest a priority. You must discover that certain blessings and assets are only found in rest. Better still, some advantages emerge exclusively in and while being alone. I think my best thoughts when I'm alone and I move faster without weight of other responsibilities and distractions. Plus, God loves to speak, especially when there are no distractions between the two of us. God recognizes the value of seclusion because he values the harvest and wine his fruit will produce. I have noticed that he has the propensity to remove and relocate individuals chosen to certain tasks to be completed from among crowds or familiar environments. It is rare that you see God calling someone to a unique destiny and him allowing them to remain where they've always been. I'm hard pressed to think of a single instance. It's almost as if he wishes to cultivate something within them. 
We see this pattern throughout the Bible. Noah experienced his own loneliness when he was called away to build the ark. Abraham was told to leave the land of his fathers for a place that God would show him before he brought Abraham into covenant with him. Joseph was sold into slavery by his own brothers, and while away from his family, God trained him to run Egypt. Moses, after having become a murderer, was driven to the wilderness where he met God and receives his orders to be the voice and deliverer to free the children of Israel. David, considered to be the runt of his family, was alone during his on-the-job training that prepared him to be the king of Israel who would succeed Saul. To the untrained eye, all of us, all of this would seem like wandering and meandering without a purpose. Could there be more to it, though? We see that being alone for a season is valuable in God's sight. But I don't want you to harp on the aloneness we have when, we, when we're thinking about this. I'm more so calling your attention to God's penchant to move you into the position and place that is most strategic for His will while you experience a feeling of being lost. He doesn't do this just to prepare you. He does this because the first thing we see God doing when we initially meet him in the first chapter of Genesis is hovering, breathing, broading, moving over the darkness and void that existed before he called the wandering, formless nothingness to order and commanded light to explode onto the scene. So what does this tell us? Quite simply, we do not serve a stagnant, motionless, dormant, inactive, or idle God. From the first time we meet him, we see that God is always on the move. God's movement suggests progress and purpose. And while he may be silent during certain seasons, we must accept the fact that our God is perpetually a moving God. Now, if we see that God is always moving with purpose, who are we to think that we would be different from the master who created us? God will move us to accomplish his ultimate goal and purpose in and for our lives. Thanks so much for stopping by. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast if this is something that's interesting to you or pass it along to a friend.